I'm not in the same location and same outfit as last time. Yes, I'm gaslighting you. I don't know what bulk filming is. Shut up. I have another fantastic statue to talk to you about today. Let me let me lay down the foundations of my inspiration for this one. You've probably seen, if you've not seen, go and watch it after my Loriston Castle video. And during my time there, I just happened to spy in the big, huge, grand sitting room. My eye straight away went to this teeny tiny little figure sat on top of a dresser. And I went up and I went, hark. I recognise that soul. And it was a miniature version of the dying Gaul. I don't know if you just believe in the power of the universe and all that, but that was the sign that I needed that I was, that's the place I needed to be. I was like, this, this, this castle's mine. <laughs> but the real one is absolutely honking massive. He's been replicated, he's been stolen, he's been moved, he's been involved with Nero, he's been involved with Napoleon himself. You name it, our big dying Gaul has done it. Not only is it an absolutely gorgeous statue, but it can also tell us loads about the sort of, I hate the term Greco-Roman, but it can tell us about both Greek and Roman attitudes towards their barbarian neighbours. So without further ado, Izzy Wizzy, let's get busy! You're welcome for unlocking about 10,000 childhood memories with that one. The Dying Gaul is a marble sculpture that dates roughly from 60 to 40 BCE. He's also known as a dying Galatian, gladiator, trumpeter, but eventually scholarship just landed on Gaul and thought, yeah, that's fine. And in short, sorry, cross my legs, in short, he depicts a fallen soldier. He's naked, he's sat on his broken sword, his shield, he's got a trumpet at his legs, not a carnix, a cornu, another Celtic trumpet, but a different Celtic trumpet. And he's got very obviously non-Roman features. The long shaggy hair, which actually, when the statue was first found, the hair was longer, but all the little sort of end pieces had broke off, so they had to give him a sort of jailbait haircut. So the hair would have been longer, but still in those sort of strands. And a torque around his neck, which is iconic Celtic fashion. However, he is not the original. This is, once again, Roman marble copy of a Greek bronze original, and was on display in either Pergamon or Delphi but by God, he didn't have him move around in his time. I can tell you that. More likely, the original monument stood at Pergamon, which is modern day Turkey. And it was possibly commissioned by Attalus I to celebrate his many military victories over the Galatians, which were basically like the local Gauls to the area. Gauls and Celts. I've mentioned this before, the wider Celtic conundrum of of being a Celt and how far it spans and how there's sort of local differences. It's a video for another time, but bear that in mind. And there wasn't just one Gaul, there was multiple, or so it's thought to have been multiple statues that made up this one monument, including the Ludovici Gaul and the Gaul in the Vatican Museum. They were all found in the same place getting onto its excavation in a wee bit, but they were found alongside our dying Gaul. Possibly also there were statues of like the victorious side, not just the dying side, you know what I mean? They would have had like Atalus' forces also commemorated in this monument. So all of them were found together, they were probably displayed together, until Emperor Nero came along and he moved the dying Gaul to Rome to decorate his golden palace. Good old neckbeard Nero. I know that Nero gets a hard time in scholarship, right? But I can't stop calling him that. That's the first thing I called him upon setting eyes on his statue. So that was absolutely uncalled for. But neckbeard Nero is just what he looks like. <laughs> anyway, the statue was re the marble one. The marble statue was rediscovered in the 17th century in the ancient gardens of Sallust on the Princian Hill. Print, print, print. Uh, oh, Princian? Prinikian? I don't know. On a hill in Rome, where the gardens of Salas used to be. This land was purchased by Cardinal Ludovico Ludovici. What a name! What a name, by the way. Where he could build his villa. It was on this land where our Gaul was discovered, along with the Ludovici Gaul and the Vatican Gaul, during the sort of excavation and construction of said villa. And our Gaul was first documented in 1623, as decorating his Palazzo Grande. Ooh la la! Trigger warning! I was about to do the 21 Pilots thing again, but I'm not, I'm not gonna do it! I'm not gonna do it! Trigger warning! Popes! And the papacy! Sorry! Pope Clement XII bought Argyll for the Capitoline collections during his reign. Reign? Term. 
tenure. Reign is not the right word for a pope, is it? What would you say a, a pope does? Don't answer that question. And he was in power from 1730 to 1740-ish. So at some point during that reign, our goal was taken to be in the Capitoline collections. Then our goal was once again moved because it was taken by Napoleon as part of the Treaty of Tolentino. I say that like a question, which was a surrender of the papacy to revolutionary France. What you said just now was really boring. I don't know. I'm not sure. That's far too modern for me and not ancient enough. Sorry. So then our Gaul sat in the Louvre until being returned to Rome in 1816. I think he did a tour of the US as well in more recent years in like the late 90s, 2000s, 2010s. It was actually like surprisingly recent in my research. I was like, oh my God. But now he's back at home in Rome in the Capitoline Museum. I'm an artist and I make art, arty art art. It's time for everyone's favourite talk about symbolism in art. The most significant message behind the dying goal is the Roman victory over the barbarians in battle, but in a respectful way, which is quite interesting, quirky and different. The Gauls slash Galatians were known for being very, very strong in battle. They were a very difficult force to beat. The creation of the dying Gaul on this monument was not only meant to say, look at us, we're the Romans and we beat the barbarians. It was also to say they were a very formidable foe. And yes, they were good, but we were better. Does that make sense? Unlike the later Cram and Lioness, which pretty much symbolizes the same thing, except without the respect. <laughs> I've mentioned this in my Cram and Lioness video, but just for a completely different comparison, the Cram and Lioness found in Edinburgh, Scotland, north of the sort of Hadrian's Wall frontier zone of the Roman Empire, a lioness, which is symbolic of Rome and the empire and its power, mauling a native barbarian Scottish man, technically, um, with his hands tied behind his back, Try to pull his head off, to be honest. There's no respect about that whatsoever. That's Roman victory over more barbarians, more sort of Celtic people, but a different group being the more Celtic, Northern British. Don't really want to say Scottish too much because it wasn't quite Scottish as you would think of it today. On the other side, sort of other side, middle of the empire at that point. Empire was pretty big, you know what I mean? Over at the Turkey bit, they were actually being respectful towards their enemies. That was also a lot earlier, whereas the Cram and Lioness being a lot later. Maybe they were just like, bulldoze the lot of them, kill them all, doesn't matter, they're not Roman. Because even though we're at two very far away geographic points, they're still part of the same wider Celtic landscape, if you will. And that's all I'm gonna say on it now because I'm not getting into that Celtic conundrum right now. Part of the dying Gaul's respect factor is built through emotion. You look at the Gaul and you see a naked man lying down, broken sword, pain in his face, you see the wound bleeding, you just feel sorry for him. You feel sympathy towards this individual who is dying on the battlefield and there is nothing that can be done to save him. And at the time, people went out and fought these wars. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat. It wasn't sniping people from 500 miles away. You know what I mean? It was actually up close and personal. And a lot of the people who would pass this monument would have dealt with something like this firsthand. They would have been involved in these sort of battles themselves or they would have family members who probably died in very similar ways. The vulnerability is also increased by his nakedness. However, that is not the original intention. In our eyes, that's seen as a very vulnerable private state, but that's actually how some Gauls fought, according to Diodorus Siculus, anyway. Some of them would don heavy armour, some of them stripped off. Especially in ancient Greece, bear in mind this statue was a Greek original, there was this artistic idea of heroic nudity, as seen all over the shop. Even on ceramics and in other statues, they're usually naked or like draped over, you know? There's usually not much left hidden. Because Greek heroes, especially on ceramics, were shown as completely naked, whereas mortals would be fully dressed. And I say it on ceramics because my dissertation was all about Exegius and how he dresses his characters, so my brain's a bit mush when it comes to that. I should say, oh that's my area of expertise, but no, it's mush. Ajax as well, there's a very powerful image if you've seen my video on Exegius. This is just one big advert for all my other videos, but if you've seen my video as an introduction to Exequius, you'll have seen the example of Ajax's suicide. But it's to make them stand out. And this idea was continued into the shift of portraying non-Greek individuals, which was mainly inspired by Alexander the Great and his journeys eastwards. Hence why the like of 
our goal and the whole monument were created and copied and copied and copied until teeny tiny versions of them end up in Lauriston Castle. But overall, yeah, it was a way of honouring a very worthy opponent in battle. I hope you enjoyed that little introduction to the dying god. He's clearly a very beautiful, important and sought out statue as we've discussed clearly everybody wants a bit of dango if i've missed anything if you want to discuss them a bit further i'm always up for chatting about this sort of stuff believe you me or if you have any questions as well feel free to fire them away in the comments section i'm also live on twitch twice three times a week if you want to actually discuss it live my bibliography will be linked down below as well in the description box if you'd like to do some further reading don't forget to like subscribe ring the bell i'm still reaching for Oh Christ, sorry itchy eye, wait now. I'm still aiming for 1,000 subscribers by the end of this year, 2023. It'd be nice if you helped me out to do that, ta. And if you're watching this and we're already out of 2023, why don't you head to my channel page, see if we've done it, see if I've managed to hit 1,000 or not, and subscribe anyway. Other than that, I bid the adieu, tie bye, cheery, and all that. I'll see you next Tuesday. <laughs>